On this episode of Law Weekly, we talk executive judiciary relationship, the anti-graft war, and the need for judicial reforms. We have the views of a senior advocate of Nigeria, Bolaji Ayonride. We also have some of the highlights from the 2019 Elders Night of the Lagos branch of the Nigerian Bar Association, plus our weekly recap of the top trending stories from the courtrooms. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shuyeli. In his first term, President Muhammad Dubari appeared to have an uneasy relationship with the judiciary. At several times, the president had cause to criticize the judiciary, especially in his efforts on the war against graft. But how important is it for there to be harmony between the two organs of government in the president's second term? This was the first question I put to my guest, Bola Jayonride, senior advocate of Nigeria. Uh, well, I would say not only in Nigeria, it's traditional anywhere in the world. Uh, the executive and the judiciary should not have a good relationship. Really? Yes, it's, it's, it's not that they should have a bad relationship. But you see, the judiciary is an arbiter between government and government, between government and the people, and between people. So really and truly, you shouldn't see the executive and the judiciary having a good relationship. You know, everybody's work is well set out. So everywhere in the world, if you in America, uh, the president uh, uh, Trump is always attacking the judiciary. You know, um, uh, I remember when the uh, when someone went to court to challenge the Brexit vote, and um, the three uh, justices of the Court of Appeal in England took a decision. Uh, to say that Parliament must take certain action even after the people had voted. And uh, you could see all the headlines in all the major newspapers. You know, one newspaper even put their pictures there and said enemies of the people, right? So the judiciary gets a bashing, but they have to be focused, they have to do their job. Public perception and confidence in the judiciary is on the decline. Some people will point to the trial and conviction of Justice Onoge as proof of this. But the jury is still out because Justice Onoga is still in court trying to clear his name. Now, a group of like-minded senior advocates under the aegis of the Justice Reform Project recently asked the Executive and the National Judicial Council to sanction other judges whose legitimate earnings do not justify their wealth. They say that the Executive has access to the asset declaration forms filed by the judges and they can use same to move against those judges whose earnings and not commensurate with their standard of living. Now, what do you think about that? And how do you think the acting CJN can improve public confidence in the judiciary? Well, you know, you accuse the CJN of corruption, you try him, you convict him, then, strangely, you accept his resignation. So, I mean, that tells you that something is wrong somewhere. You know, if you have uh, actually taking a man through the uh, hot iron and uh, you now say you create a soft landing, then that puts a question mark on the entire process. But really and truly, um, the judiciary does not really have a voice. So judges don't give uh, press conferences, they don't explain their judgments. Um, it's very important that they have a good uh, public uh, perception, but sometimes the perception, the narration can be dictated by the executive because it's the executive that has all the instruments of power. The executive can tune the people into what they want them to believe. Mind you, there are thousands of judges in this country who labor very hard, who deliver judgments in very terrible conditions. Some of them work in courts that have no fans, not to talk of air conditioners. Some of them barely have vehicles to take them to work. And they are all over the country. Some of them write longhand, you know, and you see them, they retire and two years later they are dead. You know, and, and, and we're not looking at that. So we only pick what we want to pick and make a lot of noise about the judiciary. The judiciary has the most intensive self-cleansing machinery of all the arms of government. Of all the arms of government, the judiciary cleanses itself on a daily basis. But the judiciary has no voice. 
So we all tend to say, oh, what is public perception? Is public perception what the president or what the governor thinks about, his, about the judges? I don't think so. All over the country, go to the high courts, the magistrate courts, the customary courts, the customary court of appeal, the Sharia courts. There's a lot of work going on, a lot of work. But we don't see that. What we see and what we get excited about is that one judge that we managed to kick down his door in the night and say, oh, we found this and we found that. So it's, it's a balance, right? Yes, there's always room for improvement in any endeavor of life. There's room for improvement. We have to keep on trying and trying and trying to make it better, like they do everywhere else in the world. But there are thousands of judges who are very honest, who are very dedicated, who work hard for the good of this country. What can the acting CJN do, though, to improve confidence in the judiciary? I think their work should speak for them. They should adjudicate, adjudicate properly. If they do well with their decisions, whether it goes to the left or to the right, people will appreciate it. But I don't think they should grandstand and begin to organize seminars for judges about how to fight corruption. That is not the job of the courts. As a senior advocate who acts largely as a defense counsel, how would you rate the strategies of the executive in prosecuting the anti-graft war? Well, first of all, let me correct that. Uh, I do prosecute sometimes, and I have in the past. Um, um, but um, I, I think the executive needs to invest more in the prosecution of cases. Uh, the other time, there was a lot of noise about how a former governor was uh, taken to court in the United Kingdom and he was convicted. Then, if it were in Nigeria, it would take years. Forgetting that that former governor, the Crown Prosecution Service, employed the services of a very seasoned Queen's Council who formed a team and they were very well paid. Now, if they give seasoned prosecutors and senior lawyers half of that type of money, they will walk a governor into jail in six months. In Nigeria. In Nigeria. Trust me. So, you see, you cannot prosecute successfully by using, uh, in quote, bully tactics. You must prosecute properly, get good lawyers. A former head of state referred to those type of lawyers as Obulubu lawyers. Uh, and everybody knew what he meant. You must get very good lawyers to do this job. And you must be ready to invest in that kind of prosecution. Then you will get the results. At the twilight of its tenure, the 8th National Assembly passed the Proceeds of Crime Bill of 2019. The bill provides for the establishment of the Proceeds of Crime Management Agency, which will manage seized assets and funds. And that bill is currently awaiting presidential assent. Among other things, this bill seeks to remove some critical powers from the anti-graft agencies. Do you see any need for this legislation? That legislation is uh, common all over the world. Because, um, again, when you have um, prosecuting agencies, you have investigating agencies, it is also good to have checks and balances, right? Who polices the police? If, the, if there's a problem with part of the operations of the EFCC, right now they're doing a fantastic job. But at the same time, they have lapses, maybe out of not having enough resources or manpower or whatever, but they are also bound to make mistakes. There must, we must have counter agencies or other agencies that also look at these things. So you can't put everything under, um, put everything in one basket. So it helps. So if and it's even good for the system 
so that if uh, EFCC investigates and um, they prosecute and the proceeds of crime are also kept somewhere else and is properly manned, then even EFCC will have will give a sigh of relief because there is this common trend. People asking them, "Oh, what have they done with all the money they've been collecting?" So people will direct their attention to somewhere else to know to ask, "What are they doing with all?" This? It's a relief for them. So I, I don't think these agencies are uh, there, there to, you know, compete with each other. I don't think so. I think they should complement each other. You don't see any merit in the arguments by some people that the EFCC, for instance, is doing very well in the war against graft, uh, securing convictions, recovering stolen funds, and why change what is working? Whether it is by EFCC or by the um, Produce of Crime Agency or whatever, the money still belongs to government. So it's like... Um, uh, well, sometimes, you know, you, you do have the rivalry between uh, even government, uh, government agencies and government authorities who believe, oh, we should be the ones to do this, we should be the ones to do that. But, you know, if you open up the space, it allows for more transparency so that the police can be policed. Now, as part of efforts to improve the speed of justice, President Mohamed Buhari recently wrote to the acting CJN, Justice Tanko Mohamed, asking him to initiate the process of the appointment of five more justices to the Supreme Court. Some people have suggested that apart from appointment of more justices, perhaps it's time for the judiciary to be unbundled, just like other arms of government, in such a way that uh, states will have their own judiciary up to the Supreme Court level, as is done in some other advanced democracies. What do you think? I, I think it was something we had before. Before we had the... Uh, uh, Western State Court of Appeal, well, you know, it is before the uh, before so many states came on board. So, what are we saying? The cry for federalism is getting louder and louder. We cannot shy away from it. So, there is nothing wrong with uh, the regions. We have six regions now. They are well defined. There's nothing wrong with them having their own Supreme Court, having their own courts of appeal, which may help, so that all of us are not carrying all our problems to Abuja all the time. You know, not only with uh, the judicial system, even with the economy, even with ease of governance, right? And one good thing about this agitation is that I am not sure if anybody is calling for the breakup of Nigeria. Nobody is saying so. But what everybody is saying is that after so many years, we need to try something new for the sake of development. What we do now cannot work. It has not worked. So we need to sit down and sit down and keep on reworking. So if, if, if um, this government will do well, this government will allow the space so that new ideas can come up. And when new ideas come up, you develop. Now let's round up with an eye on the legislature. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Femi Bajabiemila, is quoted as saying that Parliament will hit the ground running in terms of electoral reforms. What areas do you suppose that the legislature should be looking at in terms of electoral reforms? I think majorly the um, legislature should allow the ideas about federalism to germinate. You see, there's a foundation that is not good. Whatever you put on it will still fall like a pack of cards. So what I expect from the federal house is to encourage even the states, the House of Assemblies in different states, to open up the space, call for a referendum. It is from that that we can build up systems that will allow for good electoral reforms. It is from bottom up, not from top down. 
So they may have good intentions, but their starting point is to allow for local agitations to be well structured. I'm not talking about secession. I'm not talking about breakup, but I'm talking about improving our polity, the structure of our polity. We need to practice full and deep federalism if we are to move forward.